Um, so thank you very much for coming back from lunch. Um, my name is Philip Sibson. I'm a PhD student at the University of Bristol. And today I'll be discussing some of the recent work that my colleagues and I have been undertaking uh, in the area of integrated photonics for quantum key distribution. So in this talk, I'll hopefully provide a bit of motivation um, as to why you might want to use integrated photonics um, in quantum key distribution. I believe that exploiting the integrated photonic platform um, within QKD will actually play a big role in its uh, increased adoption. I'll illustrate this motivation uh, by reviewing uh, our fairly recent results of chip-to-chip -chip quantum key distribution with an indium phosphide transmitter and a silicon oxynitride receiver. I'll show how this platform can then uh, improve in terms of functionality by demonstrating multi-protocol operation and improving on rates in a, in a practical manner with wavelength division multiplexing. Um, I'll then go on to describe uh, implementing quantum communication devices in silicon, uh, which could ultimately lead to seamless integration with microelectronics, further miniaturization, and, and greater scalability. So as we all know, the secure transmission of information is, is, is very important for governments, corporations, individuals. And quantum key distribution can provide this such security based on the laws of physics. So over the last 25 years, um, it's rapidly grown from proof of principle experiments to robust long range demonstrations in free space, in small scale networks, and even in the deployment of commercial systems. Uh, but despite all of these advances, it's still not been widely adopted. And the practical large scale deployment of QKD will likely require integrated chip-based devices for improved performance, miniaturization, and enhanced functionality. Integrated photonics can provide a lot of the same analogous benefits that it was brought to with microelectronics. It's been steadily introduced into classical photonic systems, producing incredible functionality. And QKD can benefit from these same developments for different product scales throughout larger network scenarios. It's, it's miniaturized, which allows for portable field deployable devices. It's a platform amenable to manufacture, so it reduces costs for personal use. And it becomes possible to create large scale complex circuits with greater functionality in long haul network connections. And over the past decade or so, um, a number of groups have utilized such a platform to demonstrate some of the benefits it has to QKD. For example, uh, NTT um, in Japan demonstrated planar light wave circuits in receiver units to decode quantum messages. Los Alamos have created a transmitter uh, based on micro-optic components. My colleagues in Bristol demonstrated a chip client-based system in a plug-and-play uh, scheme. We heard earlier this week from Dirk Englund some of MIT's developments towards this goal. And there have been steps towards integration in continuous variable QKD on silicon chips from Parry Telecom. But what I'll be discussing right now is um, an illustration of the potential that integrated photonics has for secured communication by reviewing our, our demonstration of the first gigahertz clocked chip to chip uh, QKD link on separate integrated devices. The devices use state of the art manufacturing uh, processes. And uh, these were standard telecom uh, facilities. We used the reconfigurable, uh, reconfigurability of these devices to demonstrate three QKD protocols, BB84, coherent one-way, and differential phase shift. And these performances were comparable with state-of-the-art. So this is a diagram of the functional components in our QKD system. On the top left is the transmitter. And we chose indium phosphide as a platform for its capability to integrate telecommunications C-band lasers um, with good coherence, uh, 10 gigahertz or so electro-optic phase modulation, and monitoring photodiodes. It was all fabricated by a commercial facility called a Claro, and within a footprint of about six by two millimeters squared. We used the circuit for phase modulation, phase randomization, intensity modulation, and phase encoding. Uh, and it allows for the generation of weak coherent uh, states to transmit time bin encoded uh, data for a number of different protocols. Um, our silicon oxynitride receiver on the bottom uh, was chosen due to the low loss nature 
of the waveguides themselves. Uh, they have a low coupling loss between chips and fiber and a relatively high index ratio to provide small footprint devices. Uh, we can reconfigure this circuit um, using thermo-optic phase shifters represented by the gold little tabs there. Uh, it allows us to route variable proportions of, um, of the signal to off-chip single photon detectors for time of arrival detection or into phase decoding uh, circuitry. Uh, we can actually select the, the delay in an asymmetric Maxinda um, from no delay up to 2.1 nanoseconds in steps of 300 picoseconds. And this programmability could provide flexibility within a network scenario where one receiver may be, um, may be servicing a number of different transmitters with different parameters and different protocols. Uh, when communicating between these two devices, we demonstrated some good overall performance. We had an emulated 20-kilometer uh, fiber link for our 1.7 gigahertz clocked signal, and we could generate about 0.8% cube air with an estimated asymptotic secure key rate of about 0.5 uh, megabits per second. So this was great. We were able to show low errors, uh, high clock rates, and secure key rates comparable to some of the state-of-the-art. But also due to the flexibility of our photonic system, we were able to implement a number of protocols. This included decoy state BB84, um, as well as coherent one-way and differential phase shift. Again, given different users' uh, requirements in a network setting, one may be dynamically or even statically constrained to use different communication protocols um, that may not even be proposed yet. And this is the sort of platform that you would be able to provide that capability with with single devices. So that was a demonstration of our first chip-to-chip -chip quantum key distribution devices, uh, utilizing the same fabrication processes that uh, telecommunications have been um, employing recently. Uh, in particular, it was, it was gigahertz clock rates, indium phosphide transmitters, and reconfigurable silicon oxynitride receivers. Uh, but to further illustrate the practical advantages that this platform can provide, I'll discuss our next demonstration of wavelength division multiplexed QKD. So one of the limiting factors in the deployment of uh, and the adoption of QKD is those secure key rates. They're constrained by things like detector efficiency, fast and reliable single photon sources, channel loss, and the inefficiency of, um, of privacy application and error reconciliation. So one way to overcome this limitation is to multiplex multiple transmitters together um, onto the same channel. And this can be achieved with a number of different degrees of freedom. Uh, including polarization, temporal, and spatial. And what we're demonstrating here today was uh, wavelength division multiplexing, which has been vital for the increase in uh, channel rates in classical communication networks. But current bulk and fiber implementations do render this multiplexing approach infeasible on a large scale, as many of the, uh, many of the same copies of devices have to be made independently from fairly bulky components. And in telecommunication networks and data centers, space is at a premium. Um, however, the integrated photonics platform can provide a suitable uh, way of implementing such a scheme, as many copies of the same device can be fabricated on a monolithic small footprint chip without a significant increase in overhead and cost. So in the previous section, I, I described our indium phosphide and our silicon oxynitride receivers. But in this experiment, we end up using two of the indium phosphide transmitters operated at different wavelengths, combined onto the same optical channel. And then on the receiver side, we demultiplex um, in a silicon oxynitride chip uh, to demonstrate the increased rates with a limited amount of increase in error. Uh, we further use an efficient version of BB84 to increase the rates. So the on-chip laser is fabricated as a Fabric Pro cavity formed with two tunable um, distributed Bragg reflectors surrounding a semiconductor optical amplifier. And this allows us to control the central wavelength of that laser just using current injection. We see at least 50 dB or so of sideband suppression on this laser and bandwidth of around tens of megahertz. And it provides a nice clean coherent signal for us to use and it can be tuned over around seven nanometers within 1.2 volts. You can go it a little bit further, but you start to get a, a decrease in the amount of power. To combine these two signals, we used a, a beam splitter 
and adjust the intensity level uh, to compensate for this extra loss. Uh, the beam split is 50-50 over quite a wide range of, of wavelengths and therefore can be used as a flexible multiplexer so that you can match whichever demultiplexing circuit you have on your receiving uh, circuitry. So there are a number of ways that you can do the receiving uh, demultiplexing that are passive and low loss elements that are suitable for QKD. For example, uh, an array waveguide grating illustrated on the top left uh, is a device that has quite a flat passband and very limited crosstalk between non-neighboring channels. But this actually requires a little bit of complexity in the design. So for our first proof of principle, we used a max ender interferometer with a slightly different path length on either side. Unfortunately, due to the fabrication tolerances, the beam splitters were not ideal 50-50. Uh, this led one of the outputs to have a greater amount of crosstalk than the other that's illustrated over on this right-hand graph. So this crosstalk will increase errors uh, and may have led to limited rates or even lack of security. So to overcome this and to mitigate this risk, we added an extra form of filtering. Um, on the left, we illustrate the wavelength filtering as selecting a window out of a spectrum. And on the right, we describe a temporal form of filtering, which can be achieved analogously by offsetting uh, neighboring channels uh, by half a clock period and then gating the detection window. The combination of these two filters um, allow us to limit the crosstalk and, and therefore minimize the extra errors. So some of the rates that we, we got, uh, so we, we used this efficient bias basis uh, version of BB84, sending a higher proportion of uh, one basis compared to the other, uh, allowed us to increase the amount of sifted data. At the 20 kilometer distance, uh, the two channels, when operated in isolation, would give about 500 kilobits per second and 750 kilobits per second, um, with an estimated cube error of around 1%. When you operate the neighboring channels together, you're going to induce some random errors, as they're both independent and uncorrelated. These errors um, were reduced through that method of wavelength and temporal filtering that I've described, uh, but the cube error still increased slightly, up to about 1.5%. But when you combine the, the total of the two channels, you get over a megabit. You get about 1.1 megabit per second at that 20 kilometer, so approximately doubling our rates. So this experiment demonstrated that wavelength division multiplexing um, with integrated uh, photonics could be used, and that the approach provides a mass manufacturable uh, and miniaturized um, platform, making it the ideal um, scenario to implement further multiplexing. So we've got some next generation devices coming through with more transmitters, more multiplexing, all on monolithic devices, and even some that can be daisy chained together so that you can increase the amount of users almost indefinitely. Uh, the next generation of monolithic receiver chips have a number of uh, multiple configurations so that we can explore different ways to uh, get the best form factor for different network settings. Um, we've also improved wavelength filtering so that we don't have to necessarily do the temporal filtering I described and even possibly have coexistence of classical data as well. But there's still plenty of work to be uh, done in exploring different detector technology, how to implement hardware and software, uh, as well as modeling and optimizing the system that we currently have to increase the rates and the distances. So that was one of the... Uh, one of the demonstrations of integrated photonics and where you can get some benefits in terms of complexity, robustness, and, and scalability. But to truly exploit um, this platform, we will have to move to silicon photonics. Silicon photonics is a leading platform of quantum technologies with further benefits of, of greater miniaturization, uh, cost-effective manufacture, and compatibility with CMOS microelectronics. But unfortunately, effective techniques for high-speed uh, quantum state preparation in a standard silicon platform has been limited. Um, but here we're going to overcome this limitation and demonstrate high-speed, um, low-error QKD um, with a combination of slow thermo-optic phase modulation and high-speed carrier depletion modulation. So in optical communications, we rely on some form of encoding, on some degree of freedom of, of, of light. 
But unlike common telecommunication modulators like lithium niobate, um, silicon photonics doesn't have this natural chi-2 electro-optic nonlinearity. So it limits the way that we can actually prepare states. One of the available techniques is thermo-optic, and this is illustrated in the top, where a resistive element locally heats your waveguide, and this induces a phase which is quadratic with the voltage. These are ideal for state preparation as they have low propagation loss, no change in transmission, but they're also very slow, sort of on the order of kilohertz, and this would reduce your rates to almost negligible. On the other hand, fast modulation can be achieved by um, altering the free carrier density of your waveguide. This changes the absorption profile of your material and induces a phase, but it changes the transmission as well. So some of the problems that you get is, is this change in transmission, but also a saturation of the effective phase that you can induce. So we illustrate this over here with the fact that our modulator seems to be tailing off and even before we've reached pi phase difference. By combining these two modulators, though, we can overcome the limitations of each of them. So the thermo-optic phase modulators are going to be used to provide appropriate DC bi biasing, and then the carrier depletion modulators are going to be used as small AC signals. So we can demonstrate this approach for pulse modulation of coherent light in QKD. Uh, illustrated here, we've got thermo-optic phase modulators and carrier depletion modulators inside a Maxender interferometer. With the thermo-optic phase modulators, we can DC offset the, um, the MZI outputs so that we can minimize the intensity of one of these outputs with a very high extinction. Now, any small phase that we induce with the carrier depletion modulators will induce a very uh, high difference in intensity without having to reach the full pi phase shift. With that, we're able to achieve around 25 dB of dynamic extinction, 175 picosecond pulses for both periodic and non-periodic data. And this would allow us to do coherent one way between two separate chips using the silicon oxynitride receiver that I was describing before. But we can also apply this technique to encode um, BB84 states. The top uh, picture illustrates a Maxender interferometer, again with gold thermo-optic phase modulators. And with those, uh, we can generate any arbitrary quantum state, or at least one qubit state, in path encoding, where the top arm is a zero state and the bottom arm is a one state. And we can do that with almost unit fidelity. It's, it's, very, it's very high fidelity. And in this scheme, what we're going to do is we're going to use those to prepare a plus i state represented by the red dot in the middle. Now, with the non-ideal phase modulators, the carrier depletion modulators, positioned in the four parts of the interferometer, if you bias any one of them by about pi by two, you're going to prepare each one of the four BB84 states. And this is represented on the block sphere as being either direction, up, down, left, and right. Uh, by limiting the modulation to pi by two, we're going to be limiting the amount of um, the amount of phase-dependent loss that we would induce, um, as well as not having to worry so much about the saturation. And by doing this, um, it allows for high-fidelity BB84 preparation of states, which would be infeasible in, in other configurations. Um, unfortunately, path encoding isn't a particularly practical degree of freedom to do communications with. You need two separate fibers, for example. Uh, but we can take the same circuit and use it um, in a polarization uh, encoding system for free space and short range distances, or for a time bin encoding system for, for fiber-based systems. Uh, the first um, polarization version is, is labeled B, and it takes path-encoded uh, qubits and converts them into the equivalent polarization states using what's called a 2D grating coupler. The two paths are combined perpendicular to each other, and polarization is maintained out of these small devices. So the top arm becomes what we'll call vertical, and, and the bottom arm becomes what we'll call horizontal, and then any arbitrary superposition of the two. Uh, the time bin version is somewhat equivalent, but we incorporate that path-encoded version inside an asymmetric Maxender to prepare the states across two separate time bins. So we can demonstrate these um, in three different experiments, the chip-to-chip, -chip, coherent one-way, 
the polarization encoded BB84 to a, to a fiber receiver, and high-speed preparation of the time bin BB84 states. Uh, these were some of the rates. Um, so we managed to achieve with the coherent one-way up to 0.9 megabit per second, 1% QBAR, with the polarization, 1.1% QBAR, with the time bin a little bit higher with 2.1% QBAR. But we were still able to show that we've got an effective technique to overcome the limitations of high-speed modulation in silicon photonics. And with that, I'd like to quickly summarize. We've demonstrated chip-to-chip -chip quantum key distribution um, by utilizing integrated uh, components. We've demonstrated that it provides a manufacturable platform, that you can do multi-protocol operation with the increase of complexity, but you can still maintain the same high um, clock rates, low error rates, and secure key rates. We then demonstrated wavelength division multiplexing, and we use bias basis to increase the rates even further. We use two channels and a combination of wavelength and temporal filtering to double the rates up to about 1.1 megabit over a 20 kilometer link. And then finally, we illustrated an effective technique to overcome the limitations of high speed and high fidelity quantum state preparation in a silicon platform through the combination of thermo-optic and carrier depletion modulators. Uh, this platform will hopefully um, enable further multiplexing, greater complexity, and integration with microelectronics, and opens the way for larger adoption of quantum secured communication. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and ask for any questions. We have time for one or maybe two quick questions. Can you integrate detectors into the silicon chip? Say again, sorry? Can you integrate detectors? So in, in this demonstration, we were using off-chip detectors, and we've, we've done it in a com either with superconducting nanowires as well as in-gas detectors. There are uh, a lot of other work that people have been doing on integrating as, uh, SNSPDs with a number of platforms like gallium arsenide and silicon but obviously this limits the practicality of deploying these in large scale. Um, there are other work on integrating the ingas type detectors in the indium phosphide platform, and there are some work towards silicon germanium avalanche photodiodes that could be integrable with the silicon platforms as well. So at the moment we haven't done it, but it's, a, it's an ongoing investigation. Uh, so what kind of fiber to chip coupling losses are you seeing on your chips? So on the, on the transmitter side, we don't really care because we're trying to attenuate the, uh, the weak coherent signals anyway. But on the receiver side, the silicon oxynitride platform um, typically gets around a dB per facet. Uh, that's been improved um, constantly, and some of the next generation silicon devices have shown even 0.3 dB. So it's quite possible that you'll soon get 99% of your coupling between the two chips just by designing couplers in, in an appropriate manner. All right, uh, let's thank our speaker again.